Hey everybody and welcome to the Paranormal Portal. I'm your host Brent Thomas. Thank you so much everybody for being here and being a part of the journey with me. Uh, we've got an amazing show lined up for you guys today. We are joined by author John Olson who is with us and uh, he was raised in a farmhouse that was built in the 1880s and he had his very first paranormal experience at about eight years old and he'll get into all that with us. Uh, he spent the last 30 years interviewing and documenting firsthand accounts of those dealing with the paranormal, and he's the author of the Stranger Bridgeland series of books. There is eight in total, the eighth to be released this year. The new book, which will be the eighth, is called Stranger Utah. And if you want to learn more about John and all of his work, head over to strangerbridgeland.com. But I don't know about you guys, but I'm excited to get into this. So let's get going. Hey, John, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me on, Brent. This is this is a lot of fun, and I appreciate being on the show. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. I, 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 really, I really admire that not only do you have experiences, but that you've that became a catalyst for you to dedicate 30 years of your life into following and tracking this stuff down. But... I, I guess kind of the most natural place to start is where did this begin for you? Yeah, it began in, you know, as a little kid, um, I was born and raised in this house. Like you mentioned, it was built in the 1880s mm -hmm. and um, I, it wasn't long, probably like you said, by the time I was eight, I realized that there were things going on in my house that, that didn't happen in other, my friend's house. And you know, we experienced, I have an older sister and a younger brother and then my mom and dad. And as kids, we experienced everything from boot steps in the hall, uh, you know, on the staircase to things moving, things disappearing, things appearing that we didn't own in the house and, you know, even full body apparitions. Mm. And so, you know, by the time I was, you know, eight or nine, uh, my, our parents, did not want us to talk about it outside of the home. <laughs> um, in, in a small, I grew up in a small town in northern Utah, and um, this the saying I have is: when you grow up in a small town, there's two things that you like to do: that's gossip and try not to be gossip. So um, <laughs> we were trying not to be gossip, but mm -hmm. because of that, I kind of you know dove into and and tried to learn everything I could, and it just really piqued my interest not only about you know, ghosts and the things that I was experiencing, but everything about the paranormal. And um, so, you know, for the longest time until I was a teenager, I just, I just read and watched everything I could just over and over again. And um, later on in my life, I, I was diagnosed with ADHD, which made a lot of sense when I was a kid because I, I hyper-focused on, on the paranormal, which I have all my life. And so, uh, like I said, I learned everything I could with the experiences that I've had. And, um, by the time I was a teenager, I had friends, uh, that would come over to my house and they had experiences. Um, and I had to admit to my friends, oh yeah, I grew up in a haunted house. And so I started telling stories. They asked me to tell stories at parties and double dates and, and before long, you know, people started bringing me their stories and I started hunting them down too. Uh, trying to find these stories. What's really important to me in my books uh, is that it I'm able to interview the person that it actually happened to, so that it's very it's first person. And for a long time, you know, when we didn't I didn't have internet, which people have a hard time believing. My kids have a hard time <laughs> believing that we never had the internet. Sure, <laughs> you know, it was harder to hunt down people. But after my first book was published um, about nine years ago. It's been a lot easier with a website and things like that because now um, I have stories from all over the world that I've collected and are still collecting. In my last book that was out last year, uh, Stranger World, I had stories from England and Germany, Australia and Brazil. And so it's it's just been a really fun, fascinating journey and uh, just to be able to talk to people and, and have their trust in giving me their stories, I, I really appreciate 
Yeah, it's fascinating, and and I guess that's a a parallel between our two worlds because, of course, doing a doing a show, I talk to people from all over the world as well, and sometimes I, I don't know, and maybe it shouldn't, but it surprises me that there's such a continuity between you know people's experiences. Like there's there does seem to be at least a rudimentary formula for how these things develop in a sense. Would you agree with that? Yes, I definitely would. And what's, what's fascinating, some of the fascinating things that's happened to me on this journey, for example, is I will get a story from someone that is something I'd never heard of before happening. And I will, uh, I'll publish that story thinking it's a one-off kind of a thing. But then the number of people who kind of come out of the woodwork and say, I thought I was the only one that had an experience like that. And it just kind of snowballs with, with those stories. I'll, I'll give you a quick example. Um, in one of my first books, I interviewed um, a gentleman who here in Northern Utah used to camp with his family um, in the summer and their extended family. Every, they would all go camping up in the mountains here. And when he was around 10 years old, him and all the cousins were playing hide and seek and he was supposed to be the one seeking. And one of the cousins was a couple of years older than him and he really looked up to this con his cousin. And um, why he's trying to find everybody, he notices his cousin is out of camp near the canyon and his cousin is motioning for him to follow him. And so as he's like, we're playing hide and seek, that's not very good at hiding. And... <laughs> But he goes to where his cousin was and he's not there and he notices further up the trail up this little canyon his cousin again who's motioning to follow and he goes up there and his cousin's gone and again it's farther up the canyon and he follows um his cousin up the canyon quite a ways till he realizes i'm really far away from camp i'm not supposed to be this far and he kind of wigs out and runs all the way back to camp well when he gets there sitting on the fire by the fire having a hot dog is his cousin mm -hmm. and he's like what are you doing trying to lure me away from camp or trying to get me to follow you and his mother's like he was hiding underneath the trailer he was he's been here the whole time <laughs> so it was something out there was mimicking looking like his cousin trying to lure him you know further and further away wow. so I, I got that story and i wrote it thinking it was a one-off and the number of people who contacted me saying they had similar experiences as kids where either a cousin or something like an, that was an older brother or even a friend that they looked up to um, were trying to lure them into the forest or even into abandoned buildings. And um, even the number of stories that, that happened that were in that very same area where the original story came from. There was uh, two that came from within a mile of that original story. And so, like you say, it's, it's fascinating when you, when you get something and then there's continuity all the way around of, of this happening. It, it not only, you know, makes you curious about what's going on, but it, it solidifies that last story as well, kind of, you know, to those yeah. people. Yeah, absolutely. And, and phenomena like that is, is incredibly troublesome because it, it, when you think as a person who's heard stories, and of course you, you, you cover so many different things. And, and, you know, I mean, even in my case, I cover, you know, cryptids, UFOs, uh, you know, and spiritual and then strange phenomena. And, and you kind of want to like, at, at least I do, as I'm hearing a story like that, I'm trying to think, well, is that, is that just a, a, a lonely spirit? Is it some form of like doppelganger that has a, you know I, ulterior motives of some kind? Um, is it could it potentially be a skinwalker? Um, there's so many things that jump into my mind. Do you, as you're hearing stories like that, do you jump to what is it, or do you just leave it as the person's testimony and, and that's good enough? You know, sometimes. Well, most of the time, I'll try and look into it. And for example, um, I got after you know this this happened, and I got a few more stories. I tried to look into it and and see if there was any connections um, through folklore or you know anything like that. And it's very interesting because there's several you know Native American folklore, especially up in Alaska, that talks about um, 
spirits that do this very same thing to try and lure kids off into the forest. Oh, and wow. And and it also has connections with the Fey um, in Europe. That um, th- there was a you know a lot of stories and a lot of folklore about you know kids trying to be lured into the forest or replaced by doppel or by doppelgangers, and uh, they have a specific name I can't remember. But so it's it's really fascinating to me what it what it could be. I'm not one that I say well it has to be this, but I love searching through to to try and you know, back up the stories with folklore or with other stories or trying to connect the dots and figure out what it might be. So, you know, it, it could be any one of those things for sure. Right. Do you think that potentially the people who that who experience that are in potentially mortal danger or do you think it's just more, is it just more mischievous? You know, it makes me wonder, especially with the number of kids that go missing in in the forest, and um, like along with the the missing four one one, which I actually love that series. Um, it, it it makes me wonder um, what you know what it could be, and is there stories of people who who followed too far, you know? Right. So yeah, and or or is it just maybe a mischievous spirit trying to get them in trouble, or <laughs> it's any number of things like that it's but yeah. like you say it's just such a strange world we live in so yeah and it, it's as i started doing this show I, and i've told the story many times so forgive the redundancy to any of my normal listeners but i i really thought well, i can do this kind of show i know all about this stuff and then you start going into the rabbit hole and you realize i don't know anything about all this stuff this is crazy you never realize how how in depth and, and and how diversified and yet similar these experiences are and and I, I tend to be kind of a logical person so I'm always trying to you know dot the I's and cross the T's but this is not a subject matter that lends itself real well to that right right exactly yeah it's it's one of those things that is it's way out there for sure and um, it's it, it's one of those things too like like you were mentioning. You know, you'd think after 30 years, I, I'd be like, oh, I, I've seen it all or heard it all. But it's amazing how many times I get a story from somebody and it just blows my mind and it opens up a new door and makes me wonder, what is this? I'm not sure how this is connected. But Now, inversely, um, you as an author, you must get a lot of people reaching out to you. Are there, and I don't mean this in a, in a judgmental, horrible way, but I, I find myself battling with this sometimes in myself and and it's you come up I, I come up against my own personal paradigm when i'm hearing personal stories of other people and i try to re- always remain as open as i can because i couldn't possibly know all the things that are possible or impossible or if that's even a thing is there even impossible but do you sometimes run up against stories that's like God, i just can't do anything with this I, I i can't wrap my head around it so i can't put it in there is that do you have to filter sometimes as well, or do you choose not to, or what is your take on that? So I've got a stack still of stories, you know, that are not in books right now. And I have a, you know, like I said, I've got a few criteria. One, I have to, you know, interview from the person that it comes from. Um, my editor, which is also my lovely wife helps me, you know, to pick through as well. Um, you know, Yes, there, there's been in all of that time, there's been very few times where I've interviewed somebody and, and I have to go by my gut. Like, you know, when you're listening, you're talking to somebody, it's amazing. There's been so few times when I just feel like they're, they're feeding me a story (laughs) that makes sense. Oh, it does. Um, Yeah. Yeah. But, but for some reason I can really tell if somebody is, but you know, it's, it's been very rare and the only stories that I try to avoid to write about are stories where people where it's more demonic, I guess you could say, and somebody went looking for it. Those are kinds of the things that I, you know, I, I've written a couple stories about Ouija boards, but when I did it, the people that gave me those stories, their criteria were, it has to be written from a point of, um, caution, don't do this kind of a thing there. That was their caveat caveat. If I write it, make sure you don't, you know, 
make it sound fun because it was not and i want people to know it's not a good idea so you know there's there's been a few uh, stories that i've collected because i still collect everything where um it may be very much more demonic where somebody was doing something that they probably shouldn't have and ran into it just because i don't i don't like i guess encouraging that if that makes sense no i think that's that's fantastic and uh, and i think you're right i think that there has to be some kind of intrinsic responsibility for you as the person compiling these stories to be like, well, I certainly don't want other people to follow this pathway. So, you know, I'm going to keep this one out. And yeah, because I think (laughs) in a lot of ways, and maybe it's our popular culture that's really lent a lot to this uh, taking off and becoming more of an issue. But I think with the plethora of ghost shows, both on you know online streaming platforms, um, you know videos on demand, and of course network television, it kind of gives people the idea that look, you just buy these pieces of equipment and you go to all these creepy places, and you have this really amazing time, and then next week they're somewhere else. So you know it's fine. You can do this, and 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 it, I think it's it's maybe led people to a whole bunch of unrealistic expectations about what going into these places can mean or the ramifications of those actions that can impact your life and those around you. And, and yeah, I think that's incredibly responsible that you, you look at it that way. Yeah. And, and I appreciate you saying that as well. Cause um, I don't, I don't necessarily, I don't go out and do the ghost hunting thing. I do get invited by groups and, and I'll, my wife and I'll go around Halloween and stuff with different um, groups or if it's part of a, uh, you know, a podcast or something, but there are a few groups, um, around here and I, and I have a few that I trust if somebody's having an issue in their home that I work with them and I work with the people of the home because, you know, a lot of times you see, like you say on television, um, I, I relate it to if you had a hornet infestation in your house, you wouldn't want to order or wouldn't want to hire an exterminator that just came in and, beat it with a bat and got the, the wasps mad and then yeah. left yeah. because that's not what an exterminator, you know, not that, you know, you're not exterminating the ghosts, but a lot of times you see in these shows, they go in and they provoke and they get angry and they do this. And then next week they're off at somebody else's house. And I keep thinking those poor people that live there are now living with something really angry because they just came in and stirred everything up and left. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's, That's a great point. That's a great point. Um, Yeah, I do a little investigating myself, but I've really, I've really enjoyed it, and I and I try to go about it, you know, incredibly respectful because, you know, not that this is an interview about investigating, but I think that, oftentimes again, those those medias give us an unrealistic expectation that these spirits are just there to entertain us and do things for us, and and that's, I I think for whatever reason they're earthbound and, and they're working through maybe what's what's keeping them here and the last thing they need is someone coming in and you know asking them to jump through hoops and stuff that's got to be incredibly condescending and and uh disrespectful so yeah now yeah. that's that's a good point <laughs> <laughs> so how how has this through the years of doing this how has this shaped your view of the paranormal or uh, how has your your view of the these things changed over time um, you know, it's just kind of evolved with um, the the depth and and the differences the of the paranormal out there, if that makes sense. Because you know, I I write stories from all different aspects and all different things, from ghosts, cryptids, um, glitches in the matrix, and um, all you know everything. And so, what's really kind of um, I guess not necessarily changed, but solidified to me is just how strange this world really is. And I laugh at like, you know, I, I'm not anti-science whatsoever. I love science, but I listen to some, uh, you know, scientists that are like, oh, there's no way we could have UFOs because there's no way to travel faster than light and everything. And, and I laugh because, um, I, there's a, a letter written from, the uh, president of the patent office in 1895 to the president of the United States saying we should close the patent office because everything that's been invented has already been invented and we shouldn't do this anymore. <laughs> and that was right before 
we got the airplane, we got, you know, wow. all of this stuff. And so, you know, what we don't know could fill volumes and volumes. So, and that's everybody, no matter how much you've studied. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and again, this is the great unknown. I think the paranormal is the great unknown and, and probably stands to teach us a whole bunch if we're, you know, continue to look. And, and as I've said on other interviews as well, I think it's, it really does fall in line with what Tesla was talking about in, exploring the non-physical you know and how that could teach us more in a decade than we've learned in all combined history and maybe this is part of that maybe this is the non-physical manifesting itself or at least some dynamics of the of the reality we live in and how it's you know the interplays with us but i, I do want to talk with you about cryptids too because I, i'm i'm extraordinarily fascinated in this subject and and being a person that has you know, looked into this quite, quite heavily yourself. First question I would have to ask is what is the most common type of cryptid reported for you? Um, yeah, it's, it's Sasquatch okay. is the, probably the most that I've um, actually um, been able to um, get stories from. So um, especially living here in the mountains of Northern Utah, um, some of the, you know, a lot of them were close here when I first started, of course, but yeah, definitely Sasquatch. And that's probably the one that I would love the most to see myself. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, that's probably the one that, that stands out the most, I guess. Yeah. It's, it's, well, be careful what you wish for first. <laughs> right. Yeah. I know. But I, I have to wonder about, you know, being as you're in Utah and of course the, you're kind of in the, in the ballpark of the Uinta basin then, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. um there's all kinds of strangeness going on there of course there it's the home of the skinwalker ranch so ha, do you hear many many experiences people have with things like skinwalkers um yeah actually um and i think that skinwalker in in general it's kind of become a blanket statement for a lot of different things out there um, sure. that happen to people but um i have gotten quite a few um you know, skin uh, stories that I would believe would be fall under skinwalkers for sure. In my new book that's coming out, um, I like you mentioned, it's uh, Stranger Utah. I, I've come back to Utah for this one because I was collecting quite a few stories here from Utah again. And one of the things, one of the stories that I love that I, I actually interviewed the gentleman a couple months ago, he was um, in the 70s, he was a professor um, of archaeology. So he's an archaeologist, very well-educated individual and they were working on an Anastasi ruins in near the four corners of Utah and they if they stay you know they noticed if they stayed too late near dark um these giant balls of light roughly the size of a basketball would show and basically follow them out of the the site and um and they were kind of like trying to figure it out because they're all very scientific. And one night, he, everybody left but him. And he was working and it was starting to get late. And around the site, he started hearing, you know, um, something walking. Something walking all the way around the site. And he just got super scared, which you would. He ran back down to where the, his vehicle was parked. He could hear this whatever it was that was super heavy and big thing following him and he got to his car and got out of there really quick well um at the time he wasn't he in the 70s he was just barely one of the um i don't want to say lower tier but he wasn't in charge of the site but he got the archaeologist that was in charge of the site to go back with him the next morning and um both of them scientists and they walked in and where this thing had walked around the site, they found, you know, these huge wolf tracks. Now, there aren't wolves down there anymore. They're, you know, and especially in the 70s, they, they definitely, you know, weren't around. Well, they followed the wolf tracks and it had come down and then this wolf had chased him to the parking lot. And when he left and they followed the wolf tracks. And they went off from the part, you know, where he'd been parking and they followed him down through the sagebrush and everything. And about, uh, about a hundred yards from where it left there, they slowly morphed into bare feet, human bare feet tracks. 
And at that point, they both left. He tried to talk to the other archaeologist, which he refused to have the conversation and talk about. (laughs) But from then on, um, the head archaeologist of the site said, everyone will be out of there by 4 o'clock, you know, which was a couple hours before dark. No one's there before. After dawn, you know, that is the time we will work from 10 till 4. No one will be there before. No one will be there after. So, and... What I love about that story is it definitely dealt with a shapeshifter. And you're talking about two individuals who were, um, who are scientifically trained having this, this experience. So, um, yeah, there's definitely stories here in Utah about skinwalkers. That's just one of my favorites. And it's going to be in my new book. Um, but it's, it's just fascinating and awesome. I love it. Yeah. That stuff is, is so mind numbingly confusing as well as fascinating um you know the legends go back you know hundreds or maybe even more years uh that i'm aware of uh but the skinwalker thing you're right the other thing though is i think you're you're also right about the idea that everything becomes a skinwalker and that's not the way you said it but that's me paraphrasing it but in 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 several experiences and and i think it's because most people only have a few terms to choose from well it was it wasn't a big foot like a human foot so it's a a wolf-like foot or canine must be a skinwalker or a dog man or anything else but they're they're the interplay between these orb things and bigfoots and and potentially dogman too i mean i can't i can't know for sure but it's fascinating but the transformation part of that is just like wow and it's something this you know earlier i said that there's parts where i i kind of run into a wall you know logically it's like how does something transform physically from one thing into another i mean there are obviously prints that were left so it had mass it had you know it was it had weight it you know it was physically present at least in some regard enough to make tracks into the strata of the of the earth but then it became something else completely and it's like wow i mean that it's such a it's, it's such a mind bake when you try to wrap your head around that um this is kind of asking you a real curveball question but do you believe things like that are possible? And, and I mean, just whatever your opinion is, is fine. But I'm mm-hmm. honestly curious because I, like I said, I run into walls. I don't know how to process this. Right. Exactly. It is, it is really hard to process. And um, to answer your question, I do personally believe I, that things like that can happen. Mm-hmm. How it happens, I don't know. Um it's kind of like the same along the lines. Like we talked about the fact that I have not personally seen Sasquatch, but that I've interviewed so many people, and and these are you know honest, good people. Like yeah. you just get the feeling because a lot of them when they're telling you the story, they go right back to that time and get emotional in times. And so I just I can't prove or disprove it, but in my gut. I'm like, yeah, stuff, stuff like that can happen, and it's super strange and weird. But um, at the same time, uh, it, 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 may, it gets me excited about the paranormal. I mean, that spark of wanting to know more and how it happens, and it, yeah, it's it is. But it, deep in my gut, I, I would say yes, but I have no you know physical proof myself. Right. If that makes any sense. It does. I, and and I, I guess I believe it's possible too. It's just, again, the other side, like the right brain says, yeah, that's possible. And my left brain goes, but how? But how? What's going on? You know, and, and I, I don't claim to have any answers. I will I will say that I think it's, it's also important to note that transfiguration of, uh, or transformation of, is not a new concept and it's certainly not unique to the skinwalkers it's it's a, been shamanistically claimed for aeons or millennia uh you know throughout the world that that they're that they're witch doctors or shamans or, or whatever you want to call them could transform from themselves into other things and completely so and where did they get that idea well 
a lot of people maybe in our Western thinking would say, that's ah, smoke and mirrors, you know, just like a magician's trick. But what if it's not? What if, the, what if they very clearly saw, saw and witnessed this and, and just it was a matter of their life? It was just a matter of fact, just like, you, you know, you go to the grocery store and pick up milk and, and these holy people or these, these shamanistic people can just do that. Yeah, and yeah. so, yeah, I, I think it's fascinating, though. Um, do you get reports about dogmen? Um, I have gotten a few. Okay. Um, not a lot in the West, a few of them. But um, back East, I've, I've interviewed people, and um, I had one really fascinating one up in Canada where uh, this gentleman told him when he was a teenager, him and his dad used to go uh, fishing a lot. Um, they were in Canada, and it was summer, and they were on a lake. And I, I apologize, I don't have it in front of me, the name of the no, lake. Things like that go right. <laughs> Names are terrible, hard sure. for me. But um but they were just fishing and it was late because in the summertime, the sun, you know, it stays bright for a long time. And they coasted into this cove because uh, they were just pitching from the boat uh, looking for musky and some other stuff. And all of a sudden, this thing stood up next to the tree near them or stepped out from behind it. And it was, you know, it had, it stood straight up like a man and had arms, you know, you know, a hairy body. Um, but had the head of a black German shepherd. And it kind of, when it saw him, it kind of crouched a little bit and, you know, pulled back its lips and was snarling at it, at them. Um, he could feel the reverberation in his chest of this growl from this huge thing. And they both were just kind of in shock. And then it it just took off running through, uh, off and away. And they fired up the boat, went back to camp, packed up camp and left. Um, but, you know, when I interviewed him, you know, even all these years later, he just got really emotional about it. Like just the fear of going from a fun, you know, evening of fishing to just absolute terror to see something that in, like you say, in your mind, uh, shouldn't exist, you know? But that one, that one I liked too because he they were close enough. He got you know really a lot of detail, being able to see the muscles under the skin, you know, the head with the pointy ears that, that look like a German Shepherd, and um, yeah, yeah. So and and I love those stories too. I love um because they're very rare. I find that that though those are very rare cryptids or anything like that. So when I'm able to get one of those. Yeah, yeah, I get really excited about that. So, <laughs> yeah, they are incredible stories. Um, I think you know, from what I've heard, there there does seem to be a, uh, at least a pronounced difference between like a Bigfoot sighting and a Dogman sighting, whereas the Bigfoot just seems to be like incidental. They might see a Bigfoot, you know, walking in the forest, look over, it knows you're there, but it's it either doesn't care. Or it's just not at all worried about you, but the dogman reports tend to seem, to at least seem to be much more aggressive. Like, oh, you're there. Well, I'm going to be right up in your grill and growling at you now. And and they're so terrifying to me. I, I just can't imagine what it is that people are experiencing. But I, I just know that I don't want to see. <laughs> I don't want to see yeah. it. Whatever it is, I don't want it. It's just yeah. terrifying. Well, and so there's so many stories too. Like you say, they're so much more aggressive. There's stories of them, you know, trying to attack people in their cars, like yes. coming at their cars. And whereas, like you say, when when people see Bigfoot, uh, for the most part, it's accidental and it's almost, you know, they're like, oh, whoops, you know, and trying to try and get out of there. So yeah, 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 that's really crazy. So when you started doing all of this documenting, how did you get started? Did you just throw out a thread out on, out on the internet saying, hey, if you've got a story, let me know? Or how did this evolve for you through the years? So I was about 17 when mm -hmm. I started writing down the stories. And so I would have that would have been in like 92. Okay. So the internet wasn't even a thing then. My biggest thing was, you know, when I was telling stories, people would come tell me their story or they would say, hey, oh, this happened to, you know, you sh my brother or my uncle or, you know, this. And a lot of times it took 
making phone calls, hunting down these people, which were mm. so much harder back then. Sure. If they weren't bringing the stories to me, but, and like I said, um, did that for years like that. Um, until really my first book, which was nine years ago, and I was able to get a website and then put you know in my books I have my I have my email address and my you know how to get a hold of me and so um, definitely much you know a lot more flow in now than back mm-hmm. then but because back then it was so much harder and especially when you know back then you know you're working full time job you're raising a family but yeah. you're trying to find you know some individuals out there so. <laughs> yeah, I guess in, in a lot of ways, the internet has certainly streamlined our ability to communicate in a lot of ways and, and to share ideas and information. And yeah. it makes both of our jobs a lot easier. I don't know how I would, I would ever have accomplished any of this without the internet being the backbone of it all, because it's just, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not much of a networker personally, but it's, right. it's nice when people have that, that ability. So how do you, how do you see this continuing for you, uh, into the future? Um, you know, I, I'm still collecting stories and I will continue to do books as long as I, you know, keep getting stories and keep going. Mm-hmm. Um, so far I haven't seen any, you know, lack of, you know, stories coming in, which is great. Mm-hmm. Uh, here I was contacted about a month ago, um, there's a, a company out of actually out of Salt Lake. They're doing a documentary about paranormal things in in Utah, and they've asked me to be there, you know, uh, to come on and talk about it and kind of give them. So, you know, I would. That's really exciting. I I do a lot of um, speaking engagements where I go and talk at universities or at conferences, and so I just see it keep going the way it does, and and helping people, you know, get the stories out there and mm. and. You know, part of it is is very cathartic to the people that get to tell me their story. Yeah, <laughs> they get to get it out, like you said um, before, um, and maybe find other people or hear of other people who've had experiences. Because you know, ghosts are of course far and away the most stories that that I collect because I think that happens the most. Yes, um, and so you know, a lot of those people they're not even, they don't even worry about being ridiculed about telling their stories because one thing I do do do, is change people's names um, if they want and a little bit of the location just to keep their anonymity. But, um, you know, like I said, there's just not a stigma around ghosts really anymore. People are like, oh yeah, ghosts. or And now UFOs since the government is all like, yeah, yeah, there's totally UFOs. So, And that that brings up another question for me is is how... How often do you get people contacting you regarding sightings or experiences with um, UFOs? I get I get a few. Yeah, yeah, I get a few. Um, some of the some of the problem is too is they're like, oh well, you know, I saw a UFO and it sits. It's a a quick thing that yeah. they saw, mm-hmm. which is great, and I record it and everything like that. But it it doesn't necessarily make for a great story. Sure, but. I do get a lot, you know, I will get uh, what I call a diamond in the rough every once in a while where, uh, for example, there were two, this individual contacted me and this is in one of my books. It might've been the last or the one right before Um, him and his buddy used to go. We talked about the Uintas. They used to go in the Uintas hiking all the time. Okay. And (laughs) they, the biggest thing and what they love to do is, you know, there's stories of, um, of, uh, conquistador uh, gold hidden up there and mines uh, hidden. Mm-hmm. And so they would go and look and they love to explore. Well, one night they were camping, they'd hiked up, you know, a long ways into this. And this, I believe was in the seventies or eighties. So it's been a while ago. They spent all day hiking up into this small lake area and they had eaten both gone to their tents. And all of a sudden there's a huge light um, that flashes and his buddy gets him up and says, there's something down by the lake. So, you know, they get up and they walk down and near the lake is a uh, uh, sagebrush flat. And there's a trailer sitting there. It looked like one of those um, old um, silver, um, oh, I can't remember what they're called, the trailers that are kind of domed. and. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, the real uh, retro ones. I can't yeah, remember. the retro ones. Yeah. And, and there's lights coming in from inside and they can see people walking around and and some guy comes to the door and he's silhouetted from the door 
and they're just kind of cussing to themselves. They're like, we didn't see a road and somebody's <laughs> built a road up here and we hiked all the way in here. And so they're kind of cussing to themselves and they go to bed and the next day they're like, well, let's not walk, walk down and just find out where this road is and talk to those people. And they went down there. There's no road and there's only imprints in the sagebrush. <laughs> and he's like, oh my gosh, that was a UFO. That was oh, something wow. landed out there and we actually saw the, you know, the people inside he's like that was crazy but um yeah so something like that where where somebody has an experience where they actually see the occupants or there's something you know very specific about it um and like i say it's kind of a diamond in the rough but yeah I, it's it's fun i do get a lot of people that are like yeah i saw a ufo and and i interview them and they're like i was you know outside and it just kind of this huge light went by and everything and i and i'm of course it was a ufo but sure. you know it's yeah it's, there's that's quite a uh, uh an expanse of different stories there though yeah something is right. just an incidental sighting and others was like oh my god wait a minute we saw the craft sitting there and yeah. that's amazing isn't it i mean mm -hmm. i i do you have any opinions on what these things are that are that we consider ufos do you do you think they're just some cosmic cousins or or other races that come from the stars or do you think perhaps they're multi-dimensional or what do you have an opinion um i i don't know if i know i mean obviously i don't know for sure, sure. i do believe that they are they're they're here and they're from either it's either got to be a multi-dimension or from another you know another planet mm -hmm. um and they get here using multiple multiple dimensions or they're obviously able to travel faster than light or sure. um but yeah i definitely think there is something to that sure. i know that there's a lot you know just from the people that i've listened to i i know that the government knows a whole lot more than what they're saying and it would not surprise me at all if they came out tomorrow and they said oh yeah we're working with uh, the aliens they've given us sure. technology and yeah and and one of the reasons, you know, I would love to see, you know, disclosure, mm -hmm. but like I was talking with my wife the other day and she's like, well, why don't they just tell us? And I said, well, the only two things that I can think of is they're, they're either getting something from the aliens in trade that they don't want us to know about. And the other thing is too, there's so much money from the, from the very rich tied into, um, um, energy, yeah. um, petroleum, all this stuff. And if these UFOs and are able to do what they are, they've got basically what would essentially be free energy. And yeah. if tomorrow we could all put a box in the back of our, in, in our backyard and have free energy, it's going to cut off money to rich people. So they're not going to want that anyway, but yeah. It's kind of off on a tangent, but no, that's I, my idea on that. I, I kind of agree with you. I mean, there's got to be some vested interest or some reason that they're not forthcoming. I think it's it seems pretty plain to me, and, and I tried to stay away from, you know, conspiracy ideas just because I don't pretend to be intelligent enough to know or be informed enough to know. But having had experiences myself seeing these craft and and talking to so many other people that have uh, as well as you know just being a, a a consumer of the of the subject matter it seems really plain to me that they've they've been here for a long time or coming and going or have been here in some form you know taking part in in our development maybe but i, I again the fact that those videos came out of the Tic Tac craft. And that seems to be the kind of the big, the big moment in recent history of, you know, maybe we're getting closer to disclosure, but I just think you're right. I think there's too much money involved in it um, on a corporate or, you know, um, some other level um, that they're just not willing to, because the ramifications of that would change maybe the dynamic for civilization, you know, and, and I think a lot of times they used to rely on, well, you know, we can't let people know there'd be pandemonium everywhere. Uh, the religions would be undermined and all that. And it's like, no, it wouldn't because when the Tic Tac videos came out, it was like, I don't know what day of the week it is, but just for the sake of argument, it was a Tuesday. Um, they came out, people went, wow, I thought they were real. Yeah. And it was just another day. And, yeah. And it was just that, that simple. So, 
the whole public panic thing I don't think is is real. That was just a convenient excuse, but now they're just not giving any more excuses. They're just not yeah. even, you know, acknowledging it. So it's yeah. it's been a frustrating thing, I think. But you know, then again, they're at least they're consistent because they're not acknowledging any of the stuff that we deal with. And, you know, whether it's ghostly uh, presences and, and experiences or, you know, cryptids or any of it, they're just, you know, there's nothing to see here, folks. Move along, you know. It's crazy, crazy yeah. stuff. But yep. in any case, uh, you know, I, I just, I just, re I am just really glad that you're doing what you're doing because I think that by virtue of recording people's stories, uh, and this is something you and I talked about before the shows, but uh, the one thing that I take away from every story is that I think every story of a person's experience has the opportunity or potential to teach me something about this phenomena. And the fact that so many stories go un un untold or unrecorded is just such a tragedy to me. So I, it's people like you that I think are, are really carrying the burden of, you know, recording this for the rest of us so thank you so much for what you're doing brother no oh, well thank you very much i really appreciate it and i i want to just give a shout out to you know my readers out there if, if any of them are listening and i just really appreciate them because they're you know and the people who are willing to share their story and trust me with that i i there's no you know so much praise i can give them and and thanks that they trust me so yeah thank you well again could you reiterate how people can stay in touch with what you're doing yep so um you can reach me at strangerbridgeland.com uh, that's my website you can mm -hmm. contact me there you can find out about books and about my speaking engagements coming up you can find all my books on amazon under uh, stranger bridgeland uh book series mm -hmm. and um i've got a little uh, TikTok that I do, which is just John O two four three, and I just kind of do little fun things on there. And then I also have a shop there. If any of your listeners are interested in a signed copy, um, I do a signed copy and I write whatever they want to in it, so um, they can find it there as well. And so please feel free to contact me if you have a story or questions or anything. I love to hear from people. So, well, I hope you'll come back and we can dive further into all of this, but. Uh... I had a great time talking with you, brother, and, and thank you so much for being here today. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. It was it was a blast. That hour just flew by. <laughs> it's the portal. All things yeah. get weird in here. Yep. But, all right. Uh, thank you so much, John, and we'll talk to you again. Thank you.